Hello, everyone. My name is Carolina Haylock Lohr, President elect of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists, WFSA. And I am honored to share moderation with Dr. Freddy Ariza from Colombia, member of the WFSA Education Committee. I am pleased to welcome you to the WFSA webinar highlighting today the World Patient Safety Day. Congratulations to all. This year's theme of the Patient Safety Day is Improving Diagnosis for Patient Safety. This webinar aims to highlight how accurate and timely diagnosis of perioperative anemia as part of patient blood PBM programs can improve patient outcomes and ensure the safety and quality of care provided. Please keep in mind that we will have the q and A's discussion after all the presentations. Dr. Freddy. Thank you, Dr. Carolina. Well, we have joined today for celebrating the uh, safety, Patient Safety Day. It's incredible to have a, an outstanding uh, panel of experts dedicated to the field of PBM. Uh, we would like. I would like to uh, introduce our um, our panelists for today, starting for Dr. Alejandra Echeto. Alejandra is a pediatric anesthesiologist specializing in bariatric surgery for adolescents. Um, she has worked since 2018 in the center Centro Integral de Nutrición y Obesidad in San Pedro Sula and serves as pediatric anesthesiologist for congenital cardiovascular surgery at the Road Pass Foundation. Uh, Dr. Alejandra has incredible uh, contributions for medical literature on anesthesia and is a frequent speaker on international conferences and serves uh, for the Honduras Committee in the Ibero-American Ibero Society of Patient Blood Management. Our second panelist is Dr. Axel Hoffman, he, he is a doctor uh, of medical science uh, with a master of, in economics. He is uh, an adjunct professor in the University of Western Australia and a global consultant on patient blood management. Uh, he has collaborated with many teams uh, in the world. Uh, currently, he shares the uh, who's ex external steering, steering committee for PVM policy. Uh, and under his guidance, Dr. Hoffman has published extensively uh, at toward, uh, an, uh, an extension of papers uh, dedicated to the field of PBM. He served in uh, collaborating with uh, several PBM organizations and has on a high, high index uh, of 40 uh, for his publications. Uh, the third panelist is Dr. Uh, Jens Meyer. Jens is a professor and doctor in medicine and health in the intensive care unit at Kepler University Hospital. He is an anesthesiology and an intensive care specialist at Johannes Kepler in uh, Austri Austria. Professor Mayer has led numerous experimental um, papers about circulation, physiology, oxygenation, and intensive care. He uh, currently uh, is working on, in, on bleeding and coagulation and lead the patient blood management movement in all uh, the Europe continent. He has published a myriad of uh, papers dedicated to this field and uh, is uh, um, de dedicated to give lectures internationally on, and on anesthesiology, uh, critical care and patient blood management. So we have uh, an excellent panel of experts uh, that uh, will share uh, their uh, thoughts and initiatives with us. Today, we are going to start with Dr. Axel Hoffman. Dr. Axel Hoffman, please. Um, um, we are going to uh, have uh, some videos previously uh, dedicated by Dr. Irina Papieva. Dr. Dr. Irina Papieva is technical officer of the WHO patient safety flagship and by Dr. Prof. Professor Daniela Filipescu, our WFSA current president. And Dr. Daniela, please.
Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, warm greetings from Patient Safety Flagship in World Health Organization headquarters. I am pleased and honored to welcome the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists today as you gather to commemorate World Patient Safety Day. The global community observes World Patient Safety Day since 2019, following the adoption of the Resolution on Global Action on Patient Safety by the World Health Assembly. It was a milestone moment when leaders, healthcare professionals, and patients around the world united under the shared goal of making patient safety the foundation of health systems. Since then, each year we come together to highlight a specific patient safety issue requiring global attention and concerted action. This year, we are focusing on a theme that is fundamental to the very core of healthcare, yet often an overlooked aspect of patient safety, and that is diagnostic safety. This theme aligns with the actions outlined in the resolution and the Global Patient Safety Action Plan. Adopted in 2021, the action plan provides a strategic framework for stakeholders to improve patient safety, including diagnostic safety, through policy actions and the application of best practices at the point of care. Through the slogan, Get it right, make it safe, WHO calls for coordinated efforts to significantly reduce diagnostic errors. These efforts include multifaceted interventions rooted in systems thinking, human factors, and the active engagement of patients and their families, health workers, and healthcare leaders. Only together we can reduce preventable harm in healthcare, restore hope and trust towards health systems, and ensure that getting the correct and timely diagnosis is not a matter of chance, but a standard of care. I thank you for your continuous collaboration and commitment to patient safety and wish you a very successful webinar. Now we'll play the video uh, from WFSA president, Dr. Daniela Filipescu, who is live in this uh, Welcome meeting. Welcome to the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists webinar organized on the occasion of the World Patient Safety Day, which is commemorated annually on September 17th. This day is a huge opportunity to raise public awareness and promote collaboration between different stakeholders to improve patient safety. Patient safety is at the core of WFSA activities. It's our vision and also a strategic priority. This year, theme of the World Patient Safety Day improving diagnostics for patient safety highlights the critical importance of correct and timely diagnosis in ensuring patient safety and improving health outcomes. Anesthesiologists as perioperative physicians should take every reasonable measures to improve the diagnostic of pre, intra, and post-operative modifications of the physiology and patient's conditions and amend them. Knowing the high prevalence of anemia worldwide, which is both preventable and treatable, it is our role to optimize the patient's own blood volume, to minimize the patient's blood loss and enhance the patient's specific physiological tolerance of anemia, which constitute the three pillars of the modern concept of patient blood management. Recently, the WHO called for all member states to act quickly to implement national patient blood management policies to improve patient outcome and decrease the overall healthcare expenditure. We at the WFSA 
endorse this WHO call to action. Over the past year, we led innovative work in the field of PBM, including an outreach campaign to WFSA member societies to secure their support for global patient blood management declaration and commitment to patient blood management implementation. You see here the text of the declaration. Low awareness and the educational gaps in the field of PBM are among the main barriers to implementation of PBM programs to promote education on patient blood management for health professionals, we launched today a webinar series on PBM principles and programs. We take advantage of the 2024 World Patient Safety Day theme on improving diagnostic safety, and we dedicate our first webinar on the key role of detecting anemia perioperatively in order to correct it for better and safer outcome of our patients. Anemia is not a simple laboratory value. It has significant consequences. And it was extensively shown that preoperative anemia is responsible for increased morbidity and mortality. And the combination of anemia and transfusion dramatically increases the risk for adverse postoperative outcome. Knowing the global burden of diseases that could be treated by surgery and that approximately 100 million of surgeries are performed in anemic patients every year, there is also a tremendous pressure on transfusion services worldwide, especially in low and middle income countries where blood donations are insufficient for increasing access to safe emergency surgery. Therefore, correct and timely diagnosis and treatment of anemia perioperatively is key for patient safety all over the world. With the World Patient Safety Day slogan, get it right, make it, make it safe, I urge you to take the lead and diagnose anemia perioperatively in all patients to prevent the consequences of neglecting or delaying the interventions to correct it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Daniela, for your standing comments and talks. Uh, just to notice that, uh, that uh, at the end of the webinar, we will have a series of uh, questions for discussing with the panelists based on uh, suggestions from uh, many of the attendees. Um, uh, we are going to start uh, our first conference. Uh, this is by Professor Axel Hoffman. He's going to talk about identifying the world biggest patient quality and safety gap. Go ahead, Dr. Hetzel. So thank you um, for having me uh, to celebrate the uh, World Patient Safety Day together with you. Thank you to the organizers and a warm welcome to my friends and colleagues. So what is the world's biggest patient quality and safety gap? Before I start um, with my talk, uh, just my brief um, disclaimer here, governmental public institutions, blood services, professional societies, NGOs, and industry support. So here is this landmark paper in uh, BMJ from 2013, Medical Error, the third leading cause of death in the US. And as you can see, it is number three after heart disease and fatalities from cancer. Now, uh, what is um, a medical error? It's an unintended act, either of commission or uh, omission, or one that doesn't achieve its intended outcome. Or another um, definition, failure of a planned action to be completed as intended, the use of the wrong plan to achieve what do you want to achieve? And there's uh, numerous um, groups of medical errors, preventive errors, diagnostic 
treatment errors, communication errors. There's also system level errors and other errors. And therefore, the World Patient Safety Day this year is focusing on the topic improving diagnosis for patient safety. And how is error in diagnosis interrelated? Well, a diagnosis identifies a patient's health problem, and it's a key to accessing the care and treatment the patient needs. And here we have the term diagnostic error, which may include delayed, incorrect, or missed diagnosis, also the failure to communicate that explanation to the patient. And what you see here is a very sobering graph. Um, it's from the World Health Organization and from that policy brief that has already mentioned by, been mentioned by um, Daniela. We have 2.9 billion individuals with either anemia and or micronutrient deficiencies and at least 600 million individuals with chronic or acute blood loss or bleeding um, um, disorders. And the fact that we have this enormous number um, leads us to the conclusion that we basically looked at omitted diagnosis. And omitted diagnosis is one of the diagnostic errors as defined in the previous slides and uh, uh, listed by the World Health Organization. So if we um, zoom in into just the world of surgery and look at the 300 plus million major surgeries performed globally, um, we look at about 20 to 75% prevalence in hospitalized patients um, having preoperatively anemia or iron deficiency. And then we have another group somewhere between six and 12% um, uh, suffering from blood loss or coagulopathy with bleeding and in cardiac surgery, the number is even higher. And in most of these cases, we really don't look at the etiology specific cause of all these conditions. And we know that all three confound the triad of independent risk factors for morbidity and mortality. Now, here's one of many, many, many papers that shows that anemia is a killer. Um, this meta-analysis that uh, uh, took the data from 24 uh, studies with almost a million patients showed that about 39% of these patients were anemic, and the anemia is not only associated with a almost threefold increased uh, risk of uh, death, but also um, acute kidney injury, hospital acquired infection, stroke, and it's a main driver for red cell transfusion. Or if you look in, um, if we look again to our our graph, uh, we are left with the conclusion that because neither A like anemia nor B like blood loss nor C like coagulopathy with bleeding for most patients is appropriately managed. Um, the patient is left to the default treatment called transfusion. And uh, this is about 70, 80 years now that uh, the medical establishment is mainly relying on transfusion when the um, lab values um, become critical or reach a threshold in terms of hemoglobin concentration, platelet count, or INR. But are we looking at probably more medical errors when we rely on transfusion? Is transfusion really the etiology specific indication for blood loss, anemia, and coagulopathy with bleeding? Is transfusion um, a cure? Does it improve outcomes, including morbidity and mortality? Are transfusion not immun immunomodulatory, pro-inflammatory, or pro-thrombotic? Are they safe? And are there probably safer and more effective or even cost-effective modalities to treat these conditions? Well, if we go back in history, this is 1917, uh, the uh, instruction book um, for surgeons early on in Johns Hopkins. Um, and here it says, transfusions are carried out where there is no true indication for it at all. Or in The Lancet in 1936, this article titled The Use and Abuse of Blood Transfusions, transfusion of blood may be a life-saving procedure under certain circumstances. 
um, but it's too often undertaken when the doctor can think of nothing else to do after all other therapy has failed. 1942, again, in uh, The Lancet, there is now a very grave danger that the convenience of the blood bank may sometimes, if not frequently, lead to the neglect of the therapeutic ideal. And if we look at more recent data, um, like this, um, almost hard of press, no, it's from 20, uh, 2023, the median lowest hemoglobin levels on days with an RBC transfusion during our ICU stays ranged uh, from somewhere at five grams to about nine across centers or across countries. Inappropriate rates of transfusion are reported somewhere between 22 and 57 percent. Platelet usage not concordant with guidelines, critically ill, more likely to receive blood um, during the night shift. Wide variations in blood product transfusion practices in patients with acute leukemia. Discernible variability in uh, blood utilization in pediatric cardiac surgery. Or here, a almost 17-fold difference in adjusted transfusion rates across surgeons and about 13-fold difference across hospitals. Um, about uh, 13 years ago, we had this consensus conference on the appropriateness of red cell transfusion. And back then, um, the panelists basically found out that 59% of all transfusions are not uh, indicated and represent nothing but harm to the patient and cost to the system. So if we summarize this old paradigm um, that is still so, um, let's say, prevalent because of not managing properly A, B, and C, anemia, blood loss, and coagulopathy, we still have this uh, to deal with these direct risk of transfusion, but now we have all these indirect transfusion risks because we see an enormous amount of studies, at least 50 large studies with more than 8 million patients, apart from about 300 other smaller studies, and across most uh, clinical settings showing that morbidity, mortality uh, do increase with each unit given, regardless whether it's red cells, plasma, or platelets. So we look at a dose-response relationship. And we have also the variability risk that I have just demonstrated with the previous slide. So what we are looking here at in, in the under the perspective of the World Patient Safety Day and um, the problem of errors, diagnostic errors, and as we said, omitted diagnosis, we look here at probably the biggest um, patient safety gap. We have hundreds of millions of patients exposed to A, B, and C, in other words, upstream, and we have the additive risk of transfusion because we do not manage properly the A, the B, and the C problem. That is the patient safety gap. It is the omitted or incomplete etiology-specific diagnosis and treatment. And the only way to fix this problem is to manage upstream in a timely and effective way through PBM or patient blood management, which is defined as a patient-centered, systematic, evidence-based approach to improve patient outcomes by managing and preserving a patient's own blood. At the same time, also by promoting patient safety, our topic, and empowerment of patients. And this is now driven by a number of societies and endorsed um, not only by medical professional societies, but also the World Health Organization. So, the only way to crack the, the, uh, the triad is the three pillars that have been mentioned by Daniela in the um, previous uh, video. And here's the title that is now um, of, of the policy brief that basically asks um, all the member states, 194 of the WHO, to implement it and make this a priority because there is an unmet need to manage and preserve the patient's own blood. So. The comment here from the policy brief taken together, these two blocks here represent one of the world's biggest, 
largely preventable, yet greatly underestimated public health and health economic burdens. And um, diagnostic error means delayed, incorrect, or misdiagnosis, clearly the case. And so I think we are looking actually at healthcare's biggest quality and safety gap. And this is affecting many more individuals, not just those at risk of transfusion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Hoffman. Um, now we will hear the presentation of Dr. Echeto from Honduras. Dr. Echeto, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for the honor of the invitation for this wonderful webinar. I will be sharing with you the topic about perioperative anemia and how it has become an invisible challenge with crucial impact on patient safety. So I do not have any conflict of interest. And let's start by saying that as many as one third of patients undergoing elective surgery are anemic. And as um, Dr. Hoffman uh, enlightened us, preoperative anemia prevalence rates uh, are among 35 to 50% in the patients that undergo uh, major surgery. And preoperative anemia uh, prevalence rates vary uh, with different ages, sex, underlying uh, illnesses, and different types of surgery. Post-operative anemia prevalence rates also vary uh, depending on underlying illnesses, the types of surgery, and of course, if a prompt and adequate management has been given in the perioperative treatment, uh, in the perioperative period to anemia. But in general, up to 80% of patients that undergo major abdominal surgery have anemia. So, as also Dr. Hoffman already stated, Anemia has a very um, wide and extensive, strong evidence um, and a lot of data that correlates anemia with um, unfavorable surgical outcomes. Uh, anemia has been observed to be associated with perioperative mortality, morbidity, acute renal injury, surgical side infection, stroke. Uh, it has even been also um, identified as an independent risk factor uh, for a prolonged hospital stay, delayed function, recovery, and readmission. It is also a very important predictor of red blood cell transfusion, which by itself is another risk factor for adverse outcomes. So uh, to sum it up, uh, perioperative anemia uh, has a, an increased rate of risk complications of over 30%. So how do we define anemia? Anemia is defined by the World Health Organization as hemoglobin concentrations of under uh, 13 grams per deciliter or 130 um, grams per liter in adult men and uh, less than 12 grams per deciliter in adult non-pregnant women. But in recent um, reviews of perioperative anemia and patient blood management programs, and also most expert groups uh, and um, expert consensus statements have support defining anemia by the hemoglobin level of less than 13 grams per deciliter in both men and women. So in the perioperative context, uh, hemoglobin concentrations of less than 13 grams per deciliter uh, is considered the threshold where many patients will benefit for iron deficiency and nutrient deficiency studies and also from enhanced BBM measures. But there's always a but. Uh, there are current invisible and unperceived challenges for timely and effective preoperative anemia diagnosis, and most of them are institution and logistical uh, barriers such as the lack of standardization or inconsistent protocols, lack of communication between different uh, medical disciplines, short lead times such as surgical consultations and the establishing of the surgical uh, schedule date, and also even the creation of new clinical services that can diagnose and give proper treatment for anemia require investment of time and resources that are sometimes not available worldwide. 
So now that we know the impact that anemia has and the challenges for its timely diagnosis, we need to know the who, the when, and the how. So who needs to be screened for anemia? Due to the frequently high um, prevalence of anemia in the general population, all patients before surgery, except those that are undergoing minor procedures, should be screened for anemia. And screening should not be restricted to patients only undergoing elective surgery, because we have to remember that it is never too late to start anemia evaluation and treatment. Also, uh, screening, uh, the, screening, the importance of screening is highlighted, especially in patients undergoing major surgeries with risk of significant blood loss, patients with risk factors for anemia or poor anemia tolerance, and those unable or that refuse to receive blood products. So now that we know who should be screened for anemia in the perioperative uh, context, we need to know when. And there are three very important moments of perioperative anemia. Number one is the pre-surgical setting. Number two is during the procedure. And number three is in the post-surgical setting. In the pre-surgical setting, we need to screen and diagnose anemia, of course. And we need to remember that we need at least 14 days before elective surgery and preferably more than 30 days before surgery to be able to have enough time to, have to treat anemia. We also need to remember that we need to evaluate and know the cause of anemia. There are many types of anemias. Many have different etiologies, they have different laboratory characteristics, but the most important things that we have to keep in mind is number one, that 80% of anemia is iron deficiency anemia. Whenever we find iron deficiency anemia, we need to find the cause of the iron deficiency. Whenever we don't have iron deficiency, we need to find what is causing the anemia because maybe we have another uh, bigger problem. Maybe we have renal insufficiency or we have a primary hemoglobinopathy. We also need to remember that even if we have anemia of inflammation of chronic disease or we, we, if we have mixed anemias, we should also screen and search for iron deficiency because usually uh, it accompanies um, many other types of anemias, iron deficiency. So what do we need to do to find out if there is iron deficiency? We need to do um, iron studies such as serum uh, iron, total binding capacity, transferring saturation. Um, also, um, if available, of, of course, uh, erythrocyte, hemoglobin concentrations, and hepcidine. Why do we need to do that? Because that will differentiate us uh, from absolute iron deficiencies that uh, the criteria for absolute iron deficiency is serum ferritin levels of less than 30 nanograms per deciliter and uh, transferring saturations of less than 30%. Also, to differentiate if we have an inflammatory state, but we have some sort of iron deficiency because ferritin is a marker of um, inflammation, then we have the criteria of higher um, cutoff values such as 50 or 100 nanograms per deciliter, but we will always find transferring saturation uh, levels lower than 30%. Of course, we have and we can have uh, the help of other markers such as hepcidine, if we have hepcidine levels of less than 20 uh, micrograms per liter, or if we have erythrocyte hemoglobin levels of less than 29 picograms, then we can absolutely think that we have an um, uh, iron deficiency in the context of inflammation. So how do we get to uh, our diagnosis? We can have our help with preoperative anemia diagnosis algorithm. So we will have, if we have an elective surgery scheduled, we will assess and screen preferably four to six weeks prior. We need to have enough time. If we find out that we have a patient that has a hemoglobin level of less than 13 grams per deciliter, then we proceed to make all these studies, iron studies, a complete blood count, of course, and uh, other uh, nutrients to see if it, there are deficiencies. And then we will concentrate on, on the saturation, on the transferring saturation concentrations. If we have less than 30%, then we will see the serum ferritin levels. And this will define if we have an absolute iron deficiency or if we have iron deficiency in the context of a chronic disease or inflammatory states. If we have transferring uh, saturation levels of, of 
uh, greater than 30%, then we will have to look, look and search for, for specific treatment and of course, additional medical counsel and an interdisciplinary um, management. Then we will have to go to the second uh, timing and that is for the procedural. During the procedure, we have to also screen for anemia and we will have to help ourselves with the transfusion decision support algorithm. We will never transfuse if we haven't first uh, done every other option to optimize our anemia tolerance of the patient. Always remember that in young and healthy individuals with no active bleeding, no hemodynamic instability, and no symptoms of anemia, always consider very low transfusion thresholds. And to take the decision to transfuse, you first have to ask all of these questions. Is your patient severely uncompensated? Is there a severe and active ongoing blood loss? Is anemic, is anemia very symptomatic? And do you have elevated tissue hyperperfusion markers? Of course, if you have all of these, you will transfuse, but only one red blood cell unit. And please reassess after that. I think Dr. Jens will elaborate a little bit more about this. And then we have to remember about our post-surgical uh, setting in which we also have to have our screening of anemia. We have to remember to screen for hemoglobin concentrations postoperatively in certain patients that will have um, more uh, uh, frequently uh, postoperative anemia. Always use PBM principles to prevent or to mitigate the impact of postoperative anemia and consider it also that it is an acute organ injury rather than an illness at bystander. And remember that we have to treat post-op anemia before discharge. So to sum up a little bit on how we will manage anemia in surgical patients. First, all patients except those undergoing minor procedures should be screened for anemia preoperatively. If anemia is detected, its cause should be diagnosed. Cause appropriate treatment is then initiated. Preoperative iron deficiency anemia should be treated with iron therapy unless contraindicated. Intravenous iron therapy will be preferable to oral therapy when there is not enough time for oral therapy to have a very optimal response. And post-op anemia should always be treated without delay before discharge. And remember that early identification and effective treatment of anemia will most definitely improve clinical outcomes in surgical patients. So how will we uh, manage anemia? First, with oral iron, if we have enough time, more than six weeks prior to surgery. And uh, oral iron should be always offered as a first line treatment whenever possible. If we have non-urgent surgery that can be postponed, then we should delay or postpone it until hemoglobin uh, concentrations are within normal range. Uh, what is the dosage? of uh, oral iron, well, it's 100 to 200 milligrams every other day. Usually uh, intermittent uh, regimens have a better um, tolerant gastric because of the uh, side effects of gastrointestinal side effects that are usually among patients that take oral iron. And remember that we need at least uh, four weeks to have one gram per deciliter or 10 grams liter uh, increase uh, as an optimal response to treatment. And we need three months to recuperate uh, transferring saturation levels for a level above 30%. If our iron uh, is, has a suboptimal response or the patient is intolerant, then we have to do a rapid optimization of iron deficiency anemia. And if we have a short time frame before surgery, that means less than four weeks, then we can use IV iron. It is usually well tolerated. Uh, usually allergic reactions are very scarce and there is no risk of infection. What are the dosing? Well, ferric carboximal toast can be given 1000 milligrams in a week. If uh, it's still anemic after the we reassess and the dosing, then consider another 300 or 500 milligrams after one week. We can also do ferric saccharate 200 milligrams a day for two to three times a week. That means alternate days. And this is for the, as long as, uh, let's say we have two weeks before surgery, then we will place the treatment one week and then the other week. If we, and the best, uh, if we have more weeks, then we place uh, IVR in for more weeks. 
What about erythropoietin stimulating agents? Well, usually used in anemia, not iron deficiency. There is no standard dose protocol, but always use minimum clinically required dosing. If used, always use supplemental IV iron. It, IV iron should always be given when erythropoietin stimulating agents are given. And prophylactic treatment for uh, venous thromboembolism should always be considered when uh, SSR used. What are the dosing regimens? Where well, there are many dosing regimens in the literature, uh, 600 units, international units per kilogram a week for three to four weeks, or there are other dosing regimens that mention 200 units uh, per kilo per day for 10 consecutive days, or 300 units per kilo preoperatively, the surgical day, and then post-op day. And last, because it should be always last, <laughs> red blood cell unit transfusion, it should only be used when clinical needs may not be met by volume replacement or hematinic meds, only when there is severe symptomatic anemia or life-threatening uh, active bleeding. And if used, restrictive thresholds should always be employed. And to sum up some take-homes that I really want you to take, is the importance of preoperative anemia. 35 to 50% of patients preoperatively are anemic. 80% of these anemia are due to iron deficiency. 30% represent increased risk of complications if they are anemic. For the diagnosis, first identify the anemic patients, then diagnose the cause and reflex test iron studies identify if, the, if there's iron deficiency, whether it is an absolute iron deficiency or if it's iron deficiency accompanying another inflammatory or chronic disease cause of anemia. And for treatment, always oral iron first, if you have time enough before surgery. If not, do not be afraid to use IV iron if time to assess response uh, to oral, uh, oral iron is not um, effective or suboptimal, and if iron, I, um, oral iron is not tolerated, and always consider erythropoiesis stimulating agents, and always consider transfusion as your last, last, last option. Thank you very much, and this is the QR code for all the references for my um, uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alejandra, for your excellent uh, speaking. And uh, we're going to continue with Dr. Jens Meyer. Jens are going to talk about anemia or transfusion. Which risk should be avoided? Thank you, Professor Jens. Thank you very much, Freddie. I will try to bring my slides up such a way that you see them. Are they visible right now? Yeah. Yes, but not in full screen yet. Okay. Mm. Yeah, you have to click on the button on the yes. bottom right corner. I'm there. Um, that that one. Yes. Now it's full screen. Thank you. Very good. Technical problems are the best ones. So thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to show my point of view about anemia and what I'm doing, um, I have to say that it's not so easy now to add anything substantial new standing on the shoulders of giants that have been demonstrated you what is dangerous and what is to do in patient blood management. But on the other hand, what nowadays seems to be a no-brainer some years ago was not so clear as you might think. Nowadays, as Axel described, we have a definition of patient safety that clearly focuses on the reduction of the occurrence of avoidable harm. And on the other hand, for PBM, we nowadays have a definition that wants to improve patient outcomes. Pretty similar goals, different ways to get there, but not necessarily in the earlier years this was the case because patient safety when dealing with blood was talking about product safety and patient blood management was talking about the avoidance of transfusions and all the things you have heard in the first talks right now, they are a development of many, many years. And at the beginning, patient safety and patient blood management were not as close as it seems now. Now it's a no brainer that this is nearly the same thing, but years ago, this was not 
so easy to see. If we go back to the years when the term patient blood management was uh, coined, this is a final technical report about the conceptual framework for the international classification of patient safety. And if you take a look at this report, and if you take a look at what they have been discussing there, then patient safety in those years was either unsafe injection, mental health harm, diagnostic error, surgical complications, medication errors, healthcare associated infections, sepsis, and so on and so on. Or they monitored the establishment of a hemovigilance system, which was then here depicted by the income group of the country. But in the end, it was a very product driven approach for patient safety in these times. And the only chapter in this 2009 publication that was dealing with blood and blood products is this picture here. Again, clearly it's a blood product focused approach of patient safety in terms of transfusion for patients. But what you have to be aware is that the transfusion of red blood cells is a process. We are not just talking about a blood product. We are talking about a lot of different decisions. We are talking about the recruitment process, about the screening of the donors, about the preparation of the blood. And we are talking about to find the right medical reason for transfusion. After all the safety issues that might be afterwards. So. We are not only talking about that blood should be safe and should be produced in a safe manner, but that in the end, this whole transfusion process can be dangerous and tricky for patients. If you look at the middle step, then the wrong dose of frequency or the wrong quantity, this is only a very, very small amount of the topics that have been discussed in these years. So if I ask you right now, what is the right quantity of transfusion, then probably this question is not so easy to answer. And when you think, what are my indications for transfusions, then you probably have three different indications that you might cite. And not all of them are good indications to be very clear at this point. But the first is to increase the intravascular volume, for sure not first choice. The second one is to increase the viscosity of the blood of a patient. And the third is to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of a patient, which is this defined as oxygen delivery as a product of cardiac output and arterial oxygen content. So mainly we want to increase oxygen carrying capacity. But if we think about anemia this way, then we have to ask where is the limit of oxygen carrying capacity and how low can we theoretically go? This is a very classical publication from the year 2004. You see here on these two depictions, animal, uh, animal model, where small animals have been hemodiluted to a low DO2 by hemodiluting the hemoglobin down to very low values. And as you can see, surprisingly, cardiac index, stroke index, contractility, are pretty much stable for a long time. But at some time point, the whole system uh, tumbles together and the animals die. The same is true for the laboratory values that were measured in these animals. And notably, the DO2 where this happened was pretty similar for both of these entities. If you now go back to the raw data and take a look when, when the DO2 crit on the left side that has been depicted in the first two flights uh, to which hemoglobin concentration this uh, resonates, then you will see that about at the hemoglobin concentration of three, this is the time point when this whole concept of anemia tolerance begins to degrade and all the compensatory mechanisms start to stumble. So in the end, if you formulate it that way, talking about oxygen delivery, a hemoglobin concentration of three should be fine. And this is far away from what all the others so far have been talking about. Can you survive such hemoglobin concentrations? Yes, you can. A hemoglobin of 0.7 gram per deciliter was survived in the clinical setting without any sequelae. This is very, very impressive. Of course, not for a long time, but in the end, this can be survived. If we now go one step back, what should be the consequence for our daily clinical practice? 
if the theoretical transfusion threshold is about three gram per deciliter, is then a hemoglobin of 3.5 gram per deciliter safe? Is this logical? And this is completely the opposite of what the two previous speakers have been showing. Anemia is a killer full stop and there is no discussion about. I have a different paper from the year 2005. You see here the hemoglobin quintiles of patients and no matter if you take total mortality, non-cardiovascular mortality or cardiovascular mortality, if you're in a low quintile of the hemoglobin concentration, mortality increases. What they have done also, and I want to focus your attention on the right side of the slide, as soon as you're anemic, as defined by the WHO, hemoglobin of 12 or 13, then you will see that you have a hazard ratio of 1.95 for an unadjusted model or 1.38 for a model that has been adjusted for baseline cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes mellitus, cancer, ankle arm index, self-reported health status, history of cigarette use, enforced uh, vital capacity. So even if you adjust for all of these factors, it is very clear, even if you have mild anemia, you are really at risk to die. Thinking back about the oxygen transport data I have shown you, this cannot be tissue oxygenation and oxygen transport because these limits are reached at a much lower level. This is the Clevenger study where this has been investigated for operative data. If a patient has preoperative anemia and take care, this light has to be read from the left to the right, but the hemocrit decreases from left to right you can see that mortality significantly increases even for values of an hematocrit of maybe 20%. Honestly, who of you today or in the last week has sent a patient to the OR with a hematocrit of 30 where you already have a three or four fold increase of mortality and this is something we clearly should think about. Okay, I've shown you theoretically for oxygen transport and tissue oxygenation, very low hemoglobin concentration should be good. So the easy answer to increase oxygen carry capacity in any situation, and this is also something that has been pointed out by Axel, the default for many, many years could be the transfusion of red blood cells. But also here we know exactly now the more than 12 years that the number of transfusions in a cohort of nearly 1 million patients directly correlates to mortality and composite morbidity. In these studies, it's of course always difficult to find out what are confounding factors and the statistical adjustments do not uh, make the calculations very easy. But in the end, in this graph, you see that even only receiving one package of red blood cells really increases your mortality and really makes you bad. So transfusion is also not good. And this is a very recent publication from this year where you can see the relationship between post-operative complications and blood transfusion. And as you can see here on the right side on the multivariate logistic regression, you have p-values below 0.01. So all the complications, be them medical, be them surgical, they are higher in the group where patients have been transfused. Huge study, more than one 137,000 patients, so statistically very difficult to argue against. And what we have to think about is that transfusion not always increases oxygen delivery. This is a theoretical paper and the graph is not so easy to grasp, but I will explain you. If you have a hemoglobin deficit of 80%, these are the black squares at the top of the picture, then the transfusion of packages of red blood cells increases the DO2 after transfusion as compared to the anemia before. If you have no hemoglobin deficit, the additional hemoglobin increases the viscosity of blood, and this is the white bars very low, and you have even a worse tissue oxygenation. So there is a sweet spot at which the transfusion of red blood cells starts to work. And this is exactly what most people try to do. And this is exactly where the studies about liberal and restrictive transfusion regimes stem from. On the one hand, we know if you are below three gram per deciliter, you have the risk of anemia. On the other hand, 
If you transfuse the hemoglobin of 10, you only have the risk of treatment. And all these clinical studies about liberal and restricted transfusion try to find the sweet spot where the risk of these two is balanced. But in my opinion, ending up at this recommendation of seven, which in many, many studies now is seen to be as an important threshold, is a flaw because in the end, we should avoid Scylla and Charybdis instead of being eaten by the monsters or instead of being eaten by the sea. It would be much better to pull ourselves out of this situation. And what do I mean by this avoid Scylla and Charybdis? We have these three threats for patients. We have the bleeding patient, we have the patient that is anemic, and we have the patient that is transfused. And what we have to realize, to recognize is the fact that patient blood management is the avoiding of any of these. It's not good to have a patient with a hemoglobin of seven. The best patient is a patient that does not bleed, that has a hemoglobin of 15, and that does not need to be transfused. And we have patient blood management as a measure to do this. So the question I was given for my talk is somehow misleading. What is the higher risk? Everything has risks. If we manage with patient blood management, to avoid all three of these entities, in my opinion, I think we do best. And so after the years, yes, clearly we can say that patient blood management equals patient safety, but we have to be aware of the fact that this was a process and was not very clear from the beginning since um, the safety in transfusion was very much product driven. The quintessence of my talk is that patient safety and patient blood management were an unrequited love for a long time. They somehow knew that they belonged to each other, but the real connection was not found from the beginning. And it took really some years that PBM and patient safety came together. But with the new definition of patient blood management, in fact, it's a perfect fit. It's a perfect fit because both share the same goals, both are for the outcome of patients and both seek for quality. The focus has switched from product safety to process safety. And in my opinion, if you ask me what is uh, more dangerous, anemia is dangerous and should be avoided and transfusion is dangerous, dangerous and should be avoided as well. Patient blood management is the perfect toolbox for the avoidance of bleeding, anemia and transfusion. And the good thing is, even if you do not have all of the topics in this toolbox, even if something is missing, the principal concept is globally applicable, can be used all over the world, and will increase the quality of the treatment of patients. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give you these uh, thoughts. And now I'm open for questions like, I guess, anyone else. Thank you very much, Dr. Jens. Uh, now we have the time for discussion, Q and A for the panelists. And I will start with uh, this question for, uh, for everyone. What are the key roles that authorities and scientific societies can play in implementing and promoting a sustainable culture in EPBM? Anyone that can answer, I want to answer. If I may. Go ahead, please, Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, I think um, coming from this day's topic, uh, we are celebrating the Patient Safety Day. And there's not a lot authorities can do to influence clinical practice, except um, making sure that we have high safety standards. I think anchoring patient safety and EBM as a part of patient safety um, in, in the national safety framework is of utmost importance. So I think uh, we have to go back to the jurisdictions of the various countries, either the Ministry of Health or the Departments of Health, and explain them what is the role of PBM in making um, the patient's lives safer and ask them to to help with the legal framework to um, um, make PBM a standard of care because of safety. 
Thank you very much. Anyone else? If I may. Yes, um, please. Okay. In my opinion, implementation of PB blood management is a multi-stakeholder problem. And Axel has shown this in many of his publications that you really need a lot of people on board. Mm -hmm. um, you need the legislative uh, authorities, you need everyone. And this makes this, this fight so cumbersome because it's not enough that, that you have one society that gives you a recommendation for uh, transfusion value or for any algorithm, and then this will go through. Implementation works in your hospital. You have to do it at the place where you work. You has to co you have to convince all the people. The whole thing gets much more easy if you have support from the state, from medical societies. And at the moment, we have that, in my opinion, actually. I think you can support that. But implementation starts at your place, uh, and you have to do that on your own at home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yes, I, would, yes, I, mean. I, would, I would only add that the only way that governments will influence in policy regulation and policy development and they will uh, actively help you is uh, with the society and yourself as um, ourselves as anesthesiologists to insist, insist, insist and educate everyone so that they know the importance of their participation in these policies and programs to be developed and implemented. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Another question. Ah, okay. oh, please, yes, Daniela, yes. go ahead. Okay, thank you. If I may add, I am uh, convinced that uh, everyone is important in implementation, every individual doctor, but also the authorities and the national society. Uh, I um, uh, started uh, patient blood management implementation in Romania more than 10 years and we had the uh, great support from the authority and the regulation because the authorities understood that in this way they will uh, uh, decrease the blood transfusion which is insufficient uh, in our country uh, but it was not until uh, we had the full support of the national society of anesthesia and intensive care uh, uh, when uh, every every anesthesiologist started to think about how to implement uh, uh, patient blood management in, in his or her hospital. And uh, if I may add uh, uh, something more, it was a pre-submitted question to the webinar, how to start if I want to implement uh, uh, patient blood management in, in the hospital, uh, you should uh, uh, look for allies. So uh, find a surgeon, find someone in another specialty you usually work with and uh, uh, see if, uh, uh, can embrace, uh, he or she can embrace the, the patient blood management. You have to, to form a team. Uh, so find another uh, champion, other champions in your hospital, and then you will succeed. It's not a one person uh, job. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you Thanks. very much, uh, Daniela. Ready? Thank you. This is a very complicated but important question to to ask you, um, in a resourceful medical setting, if you have the opportunity to begin implementing pilot one of PBM, which patient subpopulations would you prioritize initially? Axel? Well, well yes. Well, um... <laughs> 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 I I I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't say we should we should just start with one pillar in prioritizing a a um, group of patients. I think it has to do because the the success of a PBM program, as as already pointed out by my by my colleagues, is not so much um, where do you start or with what patient population do you start. It's the question. In what hospital you are, and do you have champions? Do you have like-minded peers, regardless whether you are in the Department of Anesthesiology, and uh, if if you are an anesthetist, or you're probably a surgeon, or you're probably a quality and safety manager? You have to find the allies, and then you have to identify the low-hanging fruit in your institution. In other words, you might look at 
at that population that that is receiving currently the the, the most uh, the most transfusions and you start questioning whether um, this population can be helped um, I remember uh, years ago uh, when we started um, a program in um, in Linz um, with um, Hans Gombots um, which is the, the 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 department is now headed by Jens Meyer um, it was a time when transfusion rates in uh, institutions in Austria for orthopedic surgery, primary hips and knees, were up to 80%, right? So it was a no-brainer to start there. Nowadays, it's uh, somewhere between 0 and 1, one or 2%. Um, if you are in a cardiac, in, in a hospital, uh, in a specialized hospital for cardiac surgery, well, then you only go after cardiac. And I just relate to the, the world's largest heart center, which is Fubai Hospital in Beijing. Uh, they gradually established, and they didn't start with pillar one, by the, by, by, by the way, they started with pillar two and added pillar one later. So it really depends on the circumstances, on, on, on the low-hanging fruit and the champions that you, I, you might identify. Great. If, if, I, may, if I may add the... Uh how it started uh, because it was also a question I saw in the uh, in the box uh, if you have to treat all the patients uh, with major or, or minor surgery so we started with with patients uh, with major surgery or uh, having a risk of uh, being transfused or uh, bleeding more than 500 milliliters. So this would be the first population to start with. But for this, you have to do some homework. You yeah. have to know how much uh, uh, a type of surgery or surgeon it's uh, you know related to, to bleeding in newer hospital. You have to have this benchmark. Uh, but now we are looking to all patients because even if I will not postpone uh, one with a very minor uh, uh, surgery, okay, this is not the case of cardiac surgery, which I'm practicing, but uh, uh, we'll send afterwards the, the patient to, to, to be treated. So this brings me to uh, another question we'll send before the webinar. If it's ethical to postpone operations uh, and uh, because of anemia. And I think uh, uh, having all the data, it was prevent, uh, presented during the, the webinar by our uh, speakers. I think it's not ethical to operate on patients who are uh, anemic. Uh, and we have, at least in Europe, but they are applicable all over the world, we have two guidelines. Having a 1A recommendation, there is a guideline from the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care and the uh, guidelines from uh, European Society of uh, uh, Cardiology saying a 1A recommendation to diagnose the uh, patients uh, before surgery, non-cardiac surgery for anemia and to uh, treat uh, them. So this is ethical. Thank you. Thank you. So we can start with some uh, of the questions that were sent before uh, by the participants and also some of them in the Q&A box. And it's related to this last part that Daniela mentioned, is it's appropriate to delay or cancel scheduled surgery due to anemia? When should anemia prompt a postponement? Uh, Dr. Echetto. Hi. Uh, well, delaying or canceling uh, scheduled surgery due to anemia is sometimes necessary uh, to ensure patient safety and optimal surgical outcomes. Um, anemia might prompt a uh, postponement. Uh, you should think about uh, how severe is the anemia? Uh, how is the overall health of this patient? Does he have more comorbidities or how um, symptoms of anemia, are they severe? Um, also the underlying cause, is the underlying cause being investigated or is it already known? Is it already being treated? Uh, the surgical procedure type, of course, if, you have a, if you're gonna have a surgical procedure that is gonna have a lot of uh, uh, significant mm -hmm. amount of blood loss, uh, all of these should be taken into consideration and ultimately the decision to postpone surgery should be made collaboratively with the surgical team and also uh, talking with the patient um, 
you know, talking about the risks and benefits of proceeding versus delaying the procedure. It's um, a decision um, made by, uh, you know, the whole surgical group, uh, considering all of these uh, factors. But yes, it should be delayed or postponed if it, if it is possible and the surgery is not urgent to make those okay. hemoglobin levels the best. May I add a comment to what uh, Maria Alejandra just said? Um, when we did our program in Western Australia, which is still the largest um, PBM program uh, so far, and when we published our data with more than 605,000 patients over five years, um, the rate of anemia uh, at... Um, uh, you know, the, the, of pre-op uh, anemia was down to 14%. You've seen from the other data presented today that they are ranging somewhere between 25 and, and, and 65%, depending on the patient population. We had across the board a reduction down to 14%. And those 14% were only the urgent and emergent cases, whereas the elective cases were down to zero. So we really manage the anemia in all elective patients. And that is that shows you that it's feasible. Even in large tertiary hospitals, you can achieve such such a goal. And I think this is very uh, encouraging. And I just recommend to test the limits and doing the same in your institution. Absolutely, Dr. Axel. Uh, I have a question for Jens. Uh, um, can you discuss the risk and mechanism behind perioperative delusional anemia? What, what do you think about this this uh, issue, the perioperative? Very honestly, in my opinion, this is still one of the secrets in these fields. Because what I wanted to show you is that oxygen transport and tissue oxygenation is not the problem at the hemoglobin of seven or eight or six. We are miles away of oxygen delivery that might endanger tissue oxygenation. Of course, it can be that you have patients that have low regional blood flow, have some uh, problems in rheology, then the situation can be different. But for a young person, a hemoglobin of four or five shouldn't be a problem at all. This is one finding. Short-term anemia can easily be survived and um, shouldn't be a problem. But on the other hand, we have this phenomenon that even a small amount of anemia, when a patient undergoes surgery, is really dangerous and increases mortality. And in my opinion, it is not 100% clear whether this comes from tissue oxygenation, no, I don't think so. This is impossible, literally. In my opinion, I think we have still to find out, is anemia a sign for any other illness? But on the other hand, there are so many studies published that did an, um, that did an adjustment for so many factors that even this I do not know. So the actual mechanism, why even mild or moderate anemia during surgery is dangerous for patients, I'm completely not aware of. I honestly have to say that. I honestly have to say that that I can't that I can't judge that. But it's in my opinion one of the huge one of the huge secrets really why uh, a low hemoglobin can easily be survived and even a mild anemia can be a risk factor to die. Thank you, Jens. This is uh, our last uh, question for for Axel. Axel, um, what uh, strategies can be employed to institutionalize PVM in a setting with a, a diverse cultural context? With? In a diverse cultural context. Wh what oh. do you think we can yeah. employ as a strategy to institutionalize PVM, a PVM well, project? It's it's hard for me to answer the question about the different cultural context. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm involved in in programs now from not only Australia and Europe, um, but also in Latin America and South America in Asia, and I I can see that you know it is it is probably not so much the cultural issue. It's more, I would say. Uh, 
an economic issue. It's an issue of universal health coverage. Um, and, um, you know, I always say no, no money, no health. So it is, it is the lower and, and, and lower middle income countries that struggle the most, but not only in terms of PBM, but in terms of healthcare overall. The good, the good thing is um, in these countries, we could, we could use the economic argument even more by saying that um, there is an immediate return of investment when, when you do in these, in these low income countries, when you start patient blood management for a number of reasons, you improve productivity by, by, by improving um, the anemia status and or improving the blood health status. Um, you, you are not focusing on the establishing of, of uh, blood centers because in some countries, the unit of blood is equal to, to um, one fourth of the, of the annual per capita income. So these are non-viable um, uh, strategies. And if you then start uh, you know, focusing on, on the administration of iron, uh, for a fraction of that amount with, with a similar or better outcome. So these are incentives. Um, so that is one one factor uh, that you have to keep in mind. Um, depending on on the country, on the on the, the overall um, economic situation, I think is more important than the, than the cultural issues. Um, <laughs> and another factor is, of course, epidemiology. Um, in in some countries, you have uh, anemia of inflammation due to infectious diseases. Um, you have the problem of postpartum hemorrhage, but you don't have the problem of orthopedic or cardiac surgery because it simply doesn't exist in these countries. So you really have to look at what is epidemiologically the problem and what is health economically the problem. And from there you go and 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 um, deliver the, or offer the best possible package. At that point, I have to leave because I have to check in for my flight and I'm sitting already at the airport parking lot. Sorry for that and all the best to you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll close this webinar with some remarks. Uh, PBM offered the opportunity to give blood tissue the true importance it deserves by promoting its responsible management and preserving its vital role in patient care. And the development of PBM programs is a collective responsibility for all healthcare professionals requiring collaborative work and multi-professionality. Uh, Freddie. I, I just would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Echetto, Professor Hoffman and Professor Maya for their invaluable insights and perspectives during this outstanding webinar. As you can see, there is a significant opportunity to change how we could address the notable risk posed by the common condition of preoperative anemia with the potential to greatly improve those operative outcomes. Thank you very much, Daniela. Here's you. You are welcome. Uh, unfortunately, we have to, to stop, but before uh, uh, ending the webinar, I would like to, to thank you all, all the participants, uh, all the speakers for their outstanding presentations and uh, also to the chairs. So thank you, Carolina and Freddie. I would, I would like to thank the secretary, the WFSA secretary for organizing this. And you will see on our website other activities related to uh, patient blood management and uh, uh, also uh, on uh, the occasion on, of uh, World uh, Patient Safety Day uh, uh, which is today celebrated. And uh, uh, I would like to, to note that many, many questions which were addressed uh, before the webinar are related to uh, triggers for transfusion and things like this. So I think it's an enormous need of uh, resources. And please note that you'll find on our website a link to the NATA reviews literature reviews. You have there uh, hundreds of uh, links to the, the, the uh, most recent literature uh, addressing all your questions, but probably it's good to have also new resources. We are working on a course on patient blood management in the perioperative period, and uh, we'll also uh, add some more resources related to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for uh, organizing uh, uh, this. Thank you. And uh, happy World Patient Safety Day. 
Yes, thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.